as a clever, solitary, and extremely bored 16-year-old teenager, she once bought a dead rabbit from a butcher in Chiswick and carried it home to perform an operation on her kitchen table. I wanted to see the brain, she said. I had never seen one before. The Guardian newspaper describes our first speaker as being a little bit like electricity. She can be shocking, but also illuminating. She is a star turn on the lecture circuit, delivering rapid fire commentary on the neurochemistry of the human brain, taking us all through the mysteries of memory, cognition, and perception. So please make welcome a person once cited as the 14th most influential woman in the world in a poll in which Dolly Parton came ninth, Baroness <laughs> Susan Greenfield. Thank you very much, Michael. I've never thought of myself as a first course before, um, although I have thought of myself as way behind Dolly Pardon, and I'm sorry that she can't be here um, today. Um, but were she here, perhaps uh, she'd be doing something completely different uh, to what uh, we are all here for, which is to really explore this very exciting topic of the mind, and not just the mind, but the mind in the 21st century. So what I'd like to do is to share with you some of my thoughts as a neuroscientist. And I'd like to thank very much the organizers for the chance to come back to Australia. I love coming here. And I feel I am truly coming to my second home, so thank you for that. What we're going to look at then is how a brain, something you can hold in your hand, and as you heard, I tried to do this when I was 15, and what you didn't hear was that my three-year-old brother was standing by as well with his jaw dropping, and uh, <laughs> he's never been the same since. Um, <laughs> Uh, how something you could get under your fingernails if you were holding it without gloves, and normally you wear gloves when you're dissecting, um, how a memory perhaps could be trapped in your fingernails or a thought or an emotion, and how this banal-looking thing, which you can see top left there, how does that become you? How come this sludgy, ordinary-looking thing, which occupies the same universe as your heart or your lungs or your liver, is yet so different, because whilst you might have heart transplant or other organs transplanted with increasing facility nowadays, hands up, who would like a brain transplant? You might want to volunteer some others for one, but you know, I think we know that really this is where your individuality resides, as shown in the bottom left, and this is uh, George Bernard Shaw. Yet what was it like to be George Bernard Shaw, the famous writer, of which the writings were just a pale echo? What was going on behind those piercing eyes? We will never know, just the same as whoever is sitting next to you now. We'll never know what it's like to be you, to see the world through your eyes. However much you love someone, however articulate you are, however poetic, however musical, no one can see the world firsthand as you do. And for me, this is the fascination the fascination perhaps that we all share is why we're all here, of how we understand that first-hand perception of the world, a perception that no one has had for 100,000 years, nor will anyone again. No one will ever be you, not even a clone, an identical twin. And what for the future? Top right, is that what awakes us, this dysfunctional, mechanistic-looking nerd grinning as well? I think that's how a lot of people think of scientists, as people devoid of some kind of humanity, devoid of emotions, grinning on some kind of world domination, uh, somehow. Um, or, bottom right, are we going to not have personalities? Are we just going to be annihilated as individuals? Is that what awaits us? So these questions we're going to confront in the 25 minutes, probably, that remain, as we look at how the mind is coming from a brain and how that, in turn, is going to equip us for living in the 21st century. Well, let's start by looking at something very fundamental about the brain. And I apologize to those in the audience who are professional neuroscientists. I imagine many um, are not necessarily familiar with all the nuances of brain research. So let's just start with something that I think is really important and will really anchor us in our journey over the next 25 minutes. And it's encapsulated in this, to my mind, very revealing experiment involving three groups of adult human volunteers, none of whom could play the piano. 
and they volunteered for a five-day experiment. Now, if ever you do this, a word of advice, don't volunteer to be the control, because the controls just stared at a piano for five days. <laughs> However, the next group learned five-finger piano exercises over a five-day period. But there was a third group, and I'm going to keep them as a surprise. Let's look at the brain scans of the group that stared at the piano, the controls, the group that learned five-finger piano exercises, and the mystery third group. Now, here we are. Here you can see the days on uh, the horizontal scale, and you can see, if you look at the controls first, if you look at the brain scans, the brain is literally unimpressed, literally unimpressed by this. Nothing's happened, yeah? in parts of the brain relating to the digits. But look at the upper panels, where those who were playing uh, five-finger piano exercises, even over five days, you can see a, an astonishing change in the functional brain territory relating to the digits. But look at the third group, my surprise group. These guys just had to imagine they were playing the piano. And can you see that the change in the brain in terms of the activity of these areas is almost identical? to the physical practice. So what this tells us is imagining something is almost as good as actually doing it, and that that is merely kind of incidental. The physical contraction of muscles is incidental. But here we have a thought, an idea, translating into something we can measure and see physically. So I don't know how many philosophers are out there, but I would challenge you immediately with the old dichotomy of mind versus brain, of physical versus mental. Perhaps we should really challenge that nowadays in the light of experiments such as this. Now, what's the basis of this? What's happening? Now, in order to answer that question, we have to turn to our friends, the rodents, because we're now going to look inside the brain, and human volunteers won't let you do that. And because rats aren't too good at playing the piano, we'll have to give them something else to do. So in this experiment, you can see that a group of rats were kept in ordinary conditions on the left, an isolated lab cage, and on the right, a so-called enriched environment. Now, enriched for a rat doesn't mean to say they come to the Sydney Convention Center and uh, have a lot of interesting, uh, exciting discussions and thoughts about the mind. Enrichment for a rat, because, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, they're highly exploratory creatures, is lots of little ladders and wheels and so on. Now, let's look at a single brain cell from each of these two groups of rats. And just stare at this for a while. It might seem that these two pictures are very similar. For those of you who aren't professional neuroscientists, the blobby bit is the main part of a brain cell. But I hope you can see there's a difference beyond the blobby bit. Can you see the branches that are coming out in the isolated um, animal are sparser than in the animal that was enriched? Now, why is this? Well, the reason is, rather like anything you do, you use it or you lose it. The more you exercise something, the bigger it uh, becomes, the more it grows, the more effective. And for a brain cell... If it's working hard, if it's being stimulated, albeit playing the piano or an enriched environment, the way it will grow is to grow more branches. Why is that important? Well, what you need to know is you have up to 100,000 brain cell connections trying to make contact with any single brain cell. The greater the surface area, the more connections a brain cell can make. So we can see a direct link here between a stimulating environment that makes a brain cell work hard it in turn will respond by growing more branches, which in turn will connections. Now, how can we translate that back to us, to us humans? Well, the wonderful thing about being born a human being, as opposed to, say, a goldfish, um, and let's face it, goldfish don't have great personalities, do they? I don't know if there's any goldfish lovers here, but frankly, if a goldfish died while your child was at school, you could sneak off to the pet shop and buy another goldfish and your kid would come back and wouldn't make any difference. Now, you couldn't do that with pet, cat, or dogs, and even if they might want you to, you couldn't do it with their brothers or sisters. Yeah. They might want to. Because the wonderful thing about being a born human being, as opposed to, say, a goldfish, is that we've escaped the narrow instincts, the dictates of our genes, in favor of something that we do fantastically. We don't run particularly fast, we don't see particularly well, but what we do brilliantly, for sure, is we adapt and we learn. So even if you're a clone an identical twin, you are going to adapt to your individual and specific environment. And the way that's done is by connections. So here you see the first two years of life. The blobby bits, again, are the brain cells. Stringy bits are the connections. And can you see it is the growth of the connections that accounts the growth of the human brain postnatally? So this means that, as I say, even if you're a clone, you will have an individual pattern of connections with different strengths and weaknesses because only you have lived your life. Only you have lived your narrative. 
even if you're close to someone or living the same, under the same roof as them, only you, day, minute by minute, second by second, have a particular sequence of what's going on. So this literally shapes your brain and leaves its mark on your brain. And the more branches you have, the more connections you can make, the more, I would say, you have a personalized significance. So you're born into this booming, buzzing confusion, in the words of the great psychologist James. And you evaluate the world, how sweet, how fast, how cold, how bright, but gradually, a certain visual pattern, a certain texture, certain colors, certain smells, certain sounds, will coalesce into, say, the shape of your mother, your mother's face, and you will start to shift from raw sensation to cognition. She will mean something to you because you can evaluate her as a pattern, as connections, and if she features, as I hope she would do, again and again and again in your life, so she will trigger more and more connections, just like with the piano players. You will have personalized your brain in a way that no one else has for your mother. And so for someone else, she'll be a generic lady. For you, she means a lot. She has a significance. And you'll understand things, therefore, from a unique perspective. If you think of understanding as seeing one thing in terms of something else. Now, these are folk who are not using their connections anymore. They put themselves... Back into the booming, buzzing confusion. Techno, 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 whatever the latest one is. I don't know what you have in Australia. I'm sure you have similar things. It's kind of beat of the music where you go, you know. And sometimes people take drugs that tamper with the connections anyway. Or you put yourself in an environment stripped of cognitive content where you're back in the sensory world. And we pay money to do this, don't we? You know, whether it's wine, women, and song, drugs, and sex, and rock and roll. They all involve, interestingly enough, having a sensational time. Sensational not cognitive. You don't say, great, tonight, tonight we're going to go and have a really cognitive time. <laughs> no, I don't think anyone really many sakers for that, really. So, you know, so I think these words are not just random. We talk about letting ourselves go, blowing our mind, losing our mind, out of our mind. The very word ecstasy in Greek is to stand outside of yourself. So this abrogation of the sense of self seems something we like to do some of the time, in my own view, it involves disabling or not using or underusing the connections that give you an individual take on the world, blowing the mind, there we are. Now, sadly, sometimes people have a permanent condition under which they lose their mind, dementia. And the way we can interpret Alzheimer's disease, or more generally, dementia, which incidentally is not a natural consequence of aging, but it is a disease of older people, would be in terms of connection. So you can see this lovely Swedish lithograph, top left, and here, mirroring that, the embryo of the fetus and the early postnatal brain cell finally being mature and having its full complement of branches. But sadly, if indeed senescence does strike, that is characterized by a dismantling of the connections due to atrophy, uh, a pruning back of the branches. So I don't know if anyone in this very large audience, I'm sure there is, whose life has been ravaged by this horrible disease, by, because you care for someone who has it, I'm sure you'll agree, it's as though the person is retracing childhood, they're recapitulating childhood, where they retreat back into a world where you can't evaluate things in terms of what's happened before, you can't see a significance, you go back into a sensory world rather than a cognitive one, where suddenly you are confused and disorientated because you haven't got the checks and balances anymore of the adult mind that enables you to make sense of the world, to understand what's going on. You can no longer do that any more than a small child can do it because you don't have the associations or the connections, the cognitive take on the world. So here we are living our lives. Some people think this is downtown Oxford, where I come from. We're still living like this, uh, where everyone has a unique trajectory. And every single subsecond... Your experiences are changing very subtly the strengths and weaknesses of your connections, the pattern of your connections. And for me, this is the biological basis of the mind. It's the personalization of the brain in this way through the unique dynamic configuration of your neuronal connections that are in turn driven by your unique narrative, your unique experiences. So if that's the case, are we facing a sunrise or a sunset? Could, for the first time in the 100,000 years the human mind be radically changed. And the reason I say this is because I'm going to argue the environment is changing the way it's never changed before. So let's have a look at what the options might be for us. Well, something that perhaps came up in the 20th century is the idea that you can be a someone. We all want to be a someone, whether it's Posh and Bex, that's perhaps dubious, but we all want to be 
uh, have a status, that is to say, a standing next to someone else. And in the 20th century, the way this came about in the Western society was through advertising. And you may have heard of this man, Bernays, who was the nephew of Freud. And he had this brilliant idea of how to get people to buy things they didn't need was to persuade them it would say something about you. It would say something about you. So you see the lady smoking there on the bottom left. At a time when very few women smoked, and this was an obvious market, he didn't say, oh, have a cigarette um, because um, it will be a nice experience. No, he said, the torch of freedom. So at a time when women were not emancipated, if you had a cigarette, it would say something about you. It would say you were liberated. And this notion that it will say something about you if you own something, if you have a symbol, continues to this day. Um, I just for fun Googled on the phrase as individual as you are and look at the number of products that came up that would now, these would all let me be individual, these things would all make me be individual apparently. Here's another one, there we go. So all these things (laughs) make you individual, right? But the problem is you might buy this little thing on the left, this little charm, and then your neighbor has it as well, you say that's a problem. And they're as individual as you are and then you have this arms race for individuality via owning things, yeah? Um, because this is the way in 20th century and perhaps into, the, into now, up until now, we've tried to define ourselves as someone. And this is captured in this very good book I recommend by Oliver James called Affluenza, where he uses the metaphor of a virus for this notion that you can own something and it will say something about you or behave in a certain way, it will say something about you. But sadly, it results in depression. Um, one in four people are going to be suffering from depression this century. So one could argue that the someone scenario... Um, a consumerism, if you like. Yes, indeed, you may be an individual, but you're no fulfilled. You're on this constant treadmill to be more individual than your neighbor is. So that's not very helpful. Now, what are other scenarios in the 20th century? Well, one was I could call the anyone scenario, characterized here by the extreme movements of fascism, let's say, and Marxism, where the individual was sublimated to a grander narrative. And the individual didn't really matter. And perhaps nowadays we can think of movements continuing this notion where the individual subsumes under some great ideology. We'll call that, if you like, the anyone scenario. Now, there's lots of things wrong, wrong, of course, with these ideologies, but let's think about the anyone scenario. Someone called McLean tried to explain the fascist mentality in the middle of the last century by this rather simplistic notion of neuroanatomy, where he said the brain started off, the most basic bit was reptilian, and then you had the mammalian, and then you had the uh, more sophisticated mammalian brain. Um, wrapping around like layers of an onion, and that the problem with the Nuremberg rallies was that what was happening is that people were going back to being like reptiles again, to behaving in a very primitive way. Now, I would challenge that. For sure, when people are showing rage, they may be going back to a world where they're not using logic or cognition, but the people at the Nuremberg rallies weren't like that. They weren't in a blind rage any more than um, British footballers are in blind rages when they um, take sides and, and fight each other. No, what's happening, I think, is not so much that one can attribute uh, different types of emotions to each layer of the brain, but rather, unlike here, where you have the crime of passion, where you are kind of not aware of what you're doing, people are aware of what they're doing. And I think the issue is not so much that it's an unbridled emotion, such as road rage or a crime of passion, but rather, it is indeed a story, but it's a collective story. The story usually of David and Goliath, the under, underdog, the poor minority who have been oppressed by the evil conspiracy of whoever. Um, and that continues, I gather, in extreme fundamentalist ideas to this day, this David and Goliath notion. So it's a narrative, it's a story, it just happens to be a collective one, not an individual one. So it's highly cognitive, but it's a collective cognitive. And the issue with that, and this is another good book I'd recommend, you might think I'm spouting reading this here, um, is this was written by someone who grew up in Hitler's regime. And he said, it is a story, and that's why it was so seductive. It was a story that gave people back a sense of pride of being fighting back, you know, the, the, the little guy fighting back against uh, the evil conspiracies.